Hello, welcome back everybody. It's six o'clock, it's time for live. It's been a while. Happy to be doing this again. Every time I come down to the shop, I think I need to do another one of these things and just life and all that other stuff has gotten in the way. So um, yeah, here we are. Uh, I put out a few uh, questions via the Patreon channel, but then also on my Instagram came up with some topics and that's what tonight is focused on is the input from you guys. So always appreciate um, addressing things that, you know, the audience wants to hear. So tonight I'm going to talk about um, the, the plain options for datos and grooves and kind of walk through making datos and grooves with a couple of different methods. And then that leads nicely into the second topic, which is router planes and kind of the best practices around router planes. And I really want to try to keep it focused on those two topics and then I'll kind of open it up for questions after that, try to keep it somewhat to the point. I got some great suggestions that I just don't want to try to throw in into, into tonight's broadcast and I'll be putting into future broadcasts. So a few suggestions and stuff and you're thinking, hey, why didn't you take my suggestion? I probably did, just not tonight. Um, so yeah. Um, as always, uh, the chat room is up. Please, if you have questions, throw them into the chat room. I love it if you guys can put them in all caps. It makes it easier for me to see that. But if you forget, you know, it's not the end of the world. Um, so I'm going to get started by talking about grooves specifically. And, uh, you know, the groove is it's pretty straightforward. The, the, the plow plane tends to be the tool of choice for that. The question is what plow plane do you use and when do you stop using a plow plane and what other tools could you possibly use in addition to a plow plane? Frankly, um, when it comes to joinery planes, I usually say the router plane should be your first acquisition. It's kind of the utility uh, infielder. It can do so many different things. It's the jack plane of joinery planes. It can make grooves. Um, very slowly, we'll get to that a little bit later because this really should be a refinement tool, not a shaping tool, but it can do rabbits, it can do dados, it can do a lot of different things, which is why it really should be that first tool you pick up. But then I often say the next joinery plane after the router plane is a plow plane. Um, this is the small Veritas plow. This is a, a vintage wooden uh, screw fence plow plane. I've got a couple of these guys. I've got another one that the fence is set via wedges. It's a smaller version, um, but the fence, instead of having the screws on the side, it's just set and wedged in place. This is a fun little plane. Um, it's very specific in the blades that it takes though. They're, they're much narrower than the standard blades that you would normally find on a plow like this. But this plane is incredibly useful. Certainly anytime you make a drawer, you probably have grooves on the bottom of that for the drawer. Whether you use drawer slips or integral grooves, you gotta make those grooves. Um, if you're dealing with uh, frame and panel joinery, you gotta have grooves in order to do that. So grooves come up a lot, which is why I say that should be your next plane because it's really a specialty purpose-built tool just for making grooves. You set the fence, you set the depth stop, and you go to town. And when it comes to a lot of times when you're making grooves, it's multiple pieces. When you make a drawer box, you've got at least four pieces that need a groove in exactly the same place. Frame and panel, you've got at least four pieces where it's gotta be, the groove has gotta be exactly in the same place from piece to piece to piece. Um, and frankly, when you're building drawers, usually there's more than one drawer. So the repeatability of the plow plane is perfect for this. Um, the big difference, and, and I've worked with a vintage Stanley, uh, what is that, the Stanley 50? There's several different plows, and of course there are the, the combo planes, the 45 and the 55. Um, the dedicated plow plane, I'm pretty sure it's the 50, but anybody who's watched my channel for long knows that I'm terrible at remembering the Stanley numbering system. Uh, regardless, it, it's, it's a plow plane. <clears throat> 
I've used that a couple times. Uh, I find the fence is kind of finicky. It doesn't want to hold its position very well. Um, the wooden, uh, wooden planes, I prefer the screw adjust just because you've got a little bit more uh, precision in how you set the fence. You, you loosen the nuts um, on one side and then you've got these stop blocks on the other side that can be advanced forward and back, allowing the fence to come, to come in and out. The issue with these is they obviously are, um, they work on their own pivot. In other words, these screw arms, they're, they're attached into the fence and they can pivot back and forth. So you can actually skew the fence like we've got here. It's not parallel to the blade. So you have to um, play with it a little bit in order to get it perfectly parallel. So it's, it's a little bit fiddly in order to get it set up right. The advantage to these, once you get them set, because again, as I said, um, a lot of times when you're making grooves, it's the same setting on like six, eight, 25 different parts. So you spend a little bit of time getting it set up. Um, this is this is not square, not parallel to the blade right now. So I'd have to come in and, and loosen it up and just kind of mess around. I try to get it close by eye. Um, and then I will usually grab a ruler and I'll measure the front and the back. And that... is almost parallel. Now we're looking parallel and then I can tighten it down. So you can see it's not like, you know, really, really difficult to do. You just takes a little bit extra fiddling around. Veritas, when they came onto the scene, they have this collet mechanism that grips the fence evenly all the way around it, just like the collet of a, a powered electric router. And that's fantastic because once this is in, I mean, you can see it doesn't actually, you have to kind of jigger it into place to get it in there. It's a nice precision fit, but once it's in, it does not move. I've never had this fence shift in the 10 or more years that I've been using this. It also keeps it perfectly parallel. There is no pivot adjustment here on the fence. This is all fixed. So if I loosen one, I can't move it. And I have to loosen both. There's no pivot mechanism like that. So this is always square. Um, there really, there's no advantage, not that I can think of, to having the fence out of square. In fact, that's just gonna end up causing the blade to bind. So there's no other setting but a square, or I should say parallel fence here, which is why I really like the Veritas. Um, their new combo plane has the same setup. Their uh, skew rabbit plane has that same collet mechanism. It always keeps the fence really square, which just makes this kind of idiot proof to set up. The other thing that plow planes are all gonna have is a depth stop. And this is where the Veritas plane, frankly, sucks. <laughs> uh, that's a bit of a harsh word, but the plow, the, to me, the depth stop is not big enough. Um, it's easily fooled just by adjusting the pressure towards the toe or towards the heel, and it can very easily plane past that depth stop. At the same time, I think the depth stop on any joinery plane, whether it's a plow plane, dado plane, router plane, whatever, I think the depth stop should be a guide and shouldn't be trusted implicitly. There's so many ways to continue planing past a depth stop just by changing your body mechanics a little bit. Um, so use it as a suggestion but don't, you know, don't just go to town. Sometimes you want to have a ruler handy and just double check. If you feel like you're planning too much, double check. But the one thing that the vintage plow planes have, and this has, there's, this locks the depth adjustment and then this moves it up and down. This has, you can see it between the fence and the, uh, the skate here, this metal part's called the skate. The fence itself, spans between my fingers, big, long fence that spans a good distance in front of the blade and behind the blade. And you know, it's, it's loose right now. I can bring it in, bring it out, lower it, and then lock it in place with this other adjustment. These are much, much harder to fool because you've got a longer sole that it works over. I do find that to be a real advantage of some of these guys. The Stanley 45 and 55 have a longer depth stop setting on them as well, um, which is a nice feature. I honestly don't know what the Veritas combo plane. I haven't ever used one. Um, I do know that there have been some improvements to 
the post of the depth stop on the Veritas plane. This is like a first generation. When this thing first came out in, I think, 2008 or 2009, I bought it and I've been using it since then. Um, the fence is known to slip from time to time. I think Veritas has made multiple improvements to this in the decade or so since it first came out. So my experience, it's probably a better experience if you were to buy one of these new today. But I still have found that that smaller depth stop is a bit of an issue. You can see the same thing with a dado plane, this vintage dado plane, you can see the depth stop right there. It's relatively small. This dado plane has a much wider, not much wider, but a good inch longer. And this depth stop is a lot easier to follow. But it's still, just as a general guide, don't trust them. Just assume that you wanna, you wanna double check things. Now, um, the other difference here is the, um, the blades. Veritas has a wide number of blades available. I have a, uh, actually, this is not a quarter inch, it's a 5 16 blade in here right now. Quarter inch is probably the most common blade. The only reason there's a 5 16 in here now is I put it in incorrectly. I went and grabbed my blades and grabbed the 5 16 instead of the quarter. Obviously, they're close enough and I put it in. No big deal for demo purposes. The quarter inch blade pretty much lives in here all the time because that's what I make my drawer bottom grooves out of is a quarter inch all of my frame and panel joinery done with quarter inch grooves. It, they do sell wider blades and specifically for the combo plane, they sell much wider blades up to, I think an inch or something like that. Um, for that, you have to have a supplemental skate. Um, the Stanley combo planes have that adjustment to add a, an additional skate into place so that you've got support over the full width of that blade. So let me grab my, so here is a half inch vintage plow plane blade. And once you start to get wider, actually a half inch is pushing it. And you get wider than a half inch, you need to have it an additional skate support. There's too much blade laying unsupported out there. And the, the plane itself becomes really tippy running on just that narrow skate because Plow planes universally are going to have this like eighth inch wide narrow skate and most of them are metal. Um, there are some instances where you have a purpose built like non adjustable wooden plow plane um, where it's got, you know, wooden parts of the blade, but there's no adjustability in there because this is just so narrow. Plow planes really were more of a, um, a 19th century innovation. It's not that they didn't exist in the 18th century and earlier, but the 19th century, they took off like gangbusters and we started implementing more of these metal skates in place. But even here, you'll notice this blade, see this groove running down the back? This groove registers on the skate. And you can see this blade here, it's sitting centered on that skate. So I've got, um, it's nice and rigid as it hangs below, but the blade itself, this is a, um, I don't know how wide this is. It's less than a half inch. It's probably maybe an eighth, maybe it's three eighths, maybe a little bit wider than three eighths. Um, but there's quite a bit of blade that's unsupported here. There's no skate backing it up. And that can cause problems like tear out, which means you need to take a lighter cut with that. You gotta keep that blade sharp. Sharp fixes everything. But if you try to take a really heavy cut with that unsupported blade, you're gonna run into problems and you run into quite a bit of tear out. And that really applies with any plowing that you're doing wider than about three eighths of an inch, um, definitely half an inch. Um, and I got, I got this wooden plow plane specifically because I wanted to be able to use these wider blades. At the time, Veritas, I think only had a quarter inch uh, and the combo plane didn't exist. And this was primarily quarter inch or under. That's what I was using it for. So I got this and I was able to, with some judicious eBay buying, assemble a set of blades. They're numbered on the back um, in quarter or 16th inch increments. So the number eight is a half inch blade. Um, the funny thing was, is once I got these blades and I got them sharpened and I started putting them in the test, I never use them. It is extremely rare that I plow a groove wider than about three eighths of an inch. Extremely rare. Because again, grooves are used for housing or draw bottom for frame and panel. Most of that is quarter inch work. Um, occasionally I've had a groove um, like an, on a, like a four, um, 
four legs like posts, think arts and crafts furniture where you've got four legs anchor it and maybe you've got frame and panel sandwiched between those four post legs and you need to have a groove that houses your frame and panel. You might have a groove in that instance that could be a half inch wide, maybe three eighths, could be up to three quarter inch wide, but that's a very specific situation and I just didn't find myself needing wide blades for that very often. Um, I did make a blanket chest in the last couple of years where I needed a three quarter inch wide groove. Um, but interestingly enough, it was so far into the interior of a wide board that the fence wouldn't reach and I couldn't use the plow plane for it anyway. So all of that to say that I think where the wooden plow planes shine is that nice depth stop and their ability to handle, um, they've got more mass so they can dampen vibration. They can handle a wider blade better than this little guy. That being said, it's so rare that I ever need to use a wider blade. So tonight, as I was preparing for this demo, I pulled this out of my bottom shelf. It lives down underneath my tool cabinet, not in the tool cabinet because it doesn't get used very much. And it was covered in dust. Like I haven't used this thing in months and months and months and months because there's just really not that much call for it. So those of you who are thinking, do I go vintage wooden or go with a more modern solution? This guy really has proven its weight you know, in gold for more than a decade. It is, it is, I think, the best plow plane on the market right now. Um, the immediate question comes, you know, if I if the combo plane existed when I bought this, would I have still bought this? Probably. I've never really been a fan of combo planes. I think more than half the stuff that combo planes do, I just don't ever need to do. But that could be a very personal thing. The added mass of the combo plane, specifically the Veritas combo plane, is kind of nice, but it's not really necessary. Um, plow planes are not really hogging off massive amounts of material. So that mass is not really a big deal. If I really need that extra mass, I happen to have this guy floating around. So obviously when making a groove, that is the preferred method is using a plow plane. So rather than me just sitting here talking my head off, the other thing is um, Veritas does make this in both left-handed and right-handed. And uh, yeah, I bought the right-handed one for some reason. Who knows what I was thinking? I just did. It's not a big deal. It just means that I plane right-handed for this particular, um, this particular uh, tool. Gosh, I don't know why I could think of that. So to do that, I always use the front edge of my bench as a planing stop. Or as a like a fence to guide my fence. That's probably enough, but let's put another hold fast in just for giggles. If I were doing, you know, a whole bunch of grooves on a bunch of different boards, I would actually set up a fence. Um, I usually use my um, straight edge for that, where I'm actually clamping the fence with the hold fasts. Um, and running up against a stop like I have here, just a dog in the bench. Um, to do this, let me give you a little bit better camera angle. That idea of putting the fence or putting a bat in place just means that I don't have to uh, clamp the board down and I can flip back and forth from one board to another really quickly, which is a nice feature if you've got a bunch of pieces, but it also can be really beneficial with some of the problems that a lot of people have with plow planes. They have trouble keeping the groove nice and square and it's because the skate is so narrow and the plane itself is really tippy. So the kind of the accepted method, and I know Christopher Schwartz has talked about this for years, the problem that a lot of people have is they, they grip the plane too hard and because it's so tippy, it just ends up making it worse. I will point my finger, my index finger, just like I'm sawing, but a lot of times I won't even wrap my fingers around. I'll just kind of grab the horn in the palm of my hand and I put most of my pressure on the fence and I'm pressing the fence up against the edge of the board. I line the board with the front edge of my bench because if I'm really struggling, I happen to have um, 
an ancillary fence here. And you'll notice the Veritas has two holes in the fence that line up with these screws in here. And I can essentially create a supplemental fence that it's nearly impossible to plane out of square because I've got this huge reference surface that again is riding up the front edge of my bench. Over the years, I've it's gotten to the point where I don't know that I really need that anymore. So I'm just gonna go without um, right now. So the established technique is if I'm making a groove along this edge, I'm gonna start on the far side with a shorter pass. And I'm gonna work my way backwards. To now where I finally reach the far edge. And what that does is if the plane, say you take pressure off the fence and it comes away or whatever, um, it'll only happen over a shorter distance. By backing up each time, first of all, that first short pass I made, it created a little groove, which gives me some guidance for the blade. The next pass, I have this just little section here where there's no guidance, but the first pass was to there. So the second pass there, third, fourth, etc. So I had no guidance when I made that first pass. When I make the second one, I've got no guidance from here, but I've got guidance because the existing groove is already there and it keeps the blade in line. And as I step back further and further and further, I just establish the groove on this far side and it's, you know, whatever the thickness of the shaving is deep. Down here, I'm already in excess of an eighth of an inch deep and it gets obviously progressively shallower as I move down the board. But now when I make this long pass, the blade is kind of, locked in place. Um, it's not gonna jump out of the groove anymore because it's already relatively deep. Now that doesn't mean that you can't throw the bottom of the groove off square. And I'm actually taking kind of an aggressive cut at the moment. So I'm gonna back that off a little. Which is the other thing, if you're having trouble controlling it, lighten up the cut and you'll find that it's a lot easier to control the thing. Now that is, that's ridiculous. That's like smoothing plane shaving and we could do that and make pretty shavings and spend all day applying the groove. That's a little silly. I find that the secret to the plow plane or really any joinery plane like this, it's, mostly in the body mechanics. It's mostly in maintaining that head of steam. You know, not so much getting a run up to it, but where people tend to fall apart is they start kind of stopping and starting and pushing their way across the board. And each one of those little stops and starts, the plane will kind of move on you and you get an interrupted uh, uh, floor to the groove. So what works best, I find, is literally a nice long, you know, Monty Python silly walk. <laughs> big step forward and making that in one consistent pass. Had a little bit of a stutter there, but if you really throw in your body weight into it, you get, ah, this is hard, hard red oak right now. When you can make that in one pass like that, the whole thing ends up just being truer. Now, I have no idea what I set my depth stop to, but I'm pretty much there on the end. And I'm still maybe an eighth of an inch away from this far end. But obviously that's pretty simple. And the fact of the matter is, is if say this ended up, the floor of this groove was maybe not exactly flat or, or not exactly square to the surface or parallel to the surface of the board, this really doesn't matter because a groove is hidden joinery. A groove is really designed to have something slot into it. And the bottom of that groove is irrelevant. Um, as long as whatever you're joining together fits appropriately and you want it to fit. But the other thing is a lot of time a groove is designed to be an expansion joint. It's designed to be deeper than you actually want it. So the wood has the ability to expand and contract inside the groove. So I wouldn't really stress too much about the quality of the floor of that groove focus mainly, mainly on the extents. Is it 
the you know where I want it from the edge of the board and is it the width that I want in order for whatever piece I'm sticking in there, the panel or the drawer bottom or whatever to fit. So most of the time it's the plow plane makes grooves kind of stupid easy. You know, you set the plane, go to work and you're done. There's not a huge amount of technique to it. Using somebody like this becomes a little bit more difficult because of these long screw arms. You can see the setup that I have here now won't work. My holdfasts are actually in the way and I actually have to come up with another solution where I would use a batten again. Not even my, my straight edge will work here. I end up having to use something wider. Um, I could set this up, line it up with the edge of my bench again, and not even this batten is actually going to work because it's actually not long enough. But for demonstration purposes, oh, it's right here. So now I've got support on this with this wider board and it allows the plane to, you know, pass without running into anything. Um, but you'll also find that because the board is floating freely here, I need to have support along the entire length. As I try to make this pass, the board is going to want to shift around on me a little bit, but that also can be a very good thing. And I was starting to talk about this earlier. Any technique issues that you might have, I'm just going to go ahead and use a proper batten here. Any technique issues you might have with the board kind of jumping around can actually be solved by leaving the board free on the bench top. That sounds kind of counterintuitive. As you can tell, I'm using just plain old construction lumber that is warped like crazy. But Bat material doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to stay out of the way. So I may be struggling getting the, the plane to cut the way I want it to, to keep it online. Well, when the board is secured down to the bench, it doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't give you any feedback. As I make this pass here, the board is free to move underneath the plane. So if I'm putting too much pressure one way or another, or the plane's drifting away from this side, the board's going to move and it's going to jump around on me, telling me that I'm not pri putting even pressure on this plane as I use it. It's a small thing, but it will really go a long way to helping you to... Whoa, that went too far. <laughs> Let's back that up. That went a little too far. But here again, I'm pushing a big old giant blade through the wood here. And you gotta take a light cut. See, even that is still really heavy. And it's just going to cause a lot of tearing. I mean, it's gonna plow through. I'm taking, shoot, more than a 16th shaving. Um, but I've now got a groove that's super, super wide there. Um, I would back this out and take a lighter cut like I started with. But because the board is free to move around, it allows me to quickly switch from one part to another. But also, as I say, it really teaches you a lot about maybe inefficiencies you have in your planing technique. Let's stop and look at the chat room real quick. Uh, would it help to score the outer edges of the groove with a marking gauge? Certainly it would. I don't find that to be necessary uh, because I'm working with the grain. So assuming your blade is sharp, the edges of the blade are going to do that. Now, um, they're going to do that scoring for you. Certainly in a more open poured grain like red oak, maybe, that might be a little bit easier. It might get a little bit more of a, uh, of a frayed edge because the grain itself is more prone to splitting. But at the same time, because the grain is prone to that, you'll find that marking an edge could be a little more difficult. You wanna use a pin gauge, not a knife gauge for that because the knife gauge will follow those grain lines and you might find some, some difficulty there. For the most part, I find that to be um, a superfluous step 
doesn't really do much for me. Across the grain, dados, absolutely mandatory to do that. Um, it won't hurt. It's just an extra step if you want to look at it that way. Um, let's go. So um, I said earlier, I had a situation where I did actually need a wider groove, but it was so far into the interior of a board that I couldn't use this plow plane. So when that happens, the plow plane in general just doesn't work. Clear some of this stuff out of the way. And you have to go to another solution to make a groove. Gonna make a loud noise. All right. Um, so let's assume this was a stain board that I was using to play with some stains here. Let's uh, assume this is our project piece and I'm going to work left-handed now. This dog, for some reason, this particular dog and this particular dog hole is so tight. Well, not for some reason, because wood moves, but that particular section, that particular dog hole uh, is just ornery right now. So let's um, say I need to put a groove like six, seven inches into the interior of a board. And let's say I want that groove to be Trying not to switch out a router plane blade here. So let's make that groove about a half an inch, maybe a little more than a half an inch wide. Um, I'm laying out lines here more for demonstration. I think what I would, I mean, if I, if I had a very precise groove that needed to be made here, um, I would certainly go ahead and lay out the extents of it. So my groove is, in this case, almost smack in the middle of this board. But the time this came up before, I was building a blanket chest and I had a you know 16 inch wide panel that uh, needed to have a groove right down the middle of it. So obviously, I think the, the biggest reach I've ever seen from a plow plane is like five inches. And even then it's not really recommended because once you extend these arms out that far, it's really hard to control. The fence is way out here and it's really easy to kind of tweak it off its line because I've got this big long lever, obviously more leverage for that. The closer the fence can be, the, a lot easier it is to keep the whole thing online. So even, you know, you could say, well, I could, you know, maybe I'll make a plow plane and I'll make it super long arms. Well, there again, you saw how the hold fast got in the way of that plow plane before, that becomes an even bigger issue, but you'll find that it's just really difficult to control the whole thing. So in this instance, what I need to do is create my groove um, with something other that doesn't have a fence. Plow plane, or excuse me, a router plane doesn't have a fence. Um, a rabbit plane doesn't have a fence. If you have a rabbit plane or a shoulder plane that is the same width or narrower than the groove you want to make, that could be a possibility. I find that um, you're kind of asking for trouble in that instance. Um, a lot of times the, the rabbit plane, there's so many ways that it can go off the line. I've showed how to start a rabbit on just a knife line. You can do that, but you need to really start it on both sides of that groove and get both walls of the groove set. And then once you sink the entire rabbit plane in place and try to plow the whole thing, it gets a little chattery when you're trying to plow any rabbit plane along the entire width of the blade. Rabbit planes are designed to have part of the blade hanging over. Um, the more the blade you engage, the lighter that cut's got to be to prevent too much chatter and the sharper the blade's got to be to prevent too much chatter. So I find trying to engage the entire blade on a rabbit plane, it works, but it, it should be kind of the last step. You should do most of the heavy removal with something else and just finesse and flatten the bottom of that groove with a rabbit plane, or in this instance, the router plane. So what I really need to do is 
find my straight edge, I need to cut the extents of the groove with another method. And I find that method is best done with a saw. Uh, this is, let's do it this way. I need to get it so that my dog holes can access the fence. So now I've got my straight edge basically just lined up with the, um, the pencil line that I put on here. And I use a saw. My free hand resting it up against the straight edge. And certainly I've got my hand on the handle, but what I'm actually doing more than anything is kind of like a, a rabbit plane where I've got my thumb on the spine and that's actually doing a fair amount of the pushing. Like I could take my hand off the handle and this hand's doing most of the work. It's certainly a lot easier when you've got leverage back here to push. Now, when you do this, you gotta take nice long strokes because those gullets are filling up with sawdust. Every pass, they're filling up right about there. And if you listen, you can actually hear the difference in the, the tone of the saw as it fills up those gullets. Um, they also can tend to get kind of gummed in there if you don't stop and every now and then and clear them out. So really make sure you're extending past the board and if necessary, pulling it way past the board so that you're, you should have little piles of sawdust all on the fence on both sides of the board. And I do, I've got all kinds of sawdust on both sides because as I pull back, the gullets are dumping the sawdust and as I pull forward, they're dumping the sawdust. The good news is, is most grooves are not particularly deep. If I were doing some actual joinery here, I would be a little bit more exacting in, uh, in um, my depth, but usually as exacting as I am, the most exact I get rather is I usually will put blue tape on the plate of the saw based on the depth of the groove. There's no actual stop. I remember I played with um, a board that I could, uh, I had rare earth magnets at one point and stuck it to the plate. No matter what it did, it slid around. I used double stick tape one time and put it on there and it just ended up being way too much trouble. You can put blue tape on, you know, measure the distance, keep it parallel and you just observe, <laughs> just pay attention to the blue tape line and saw until the blue tape touches. And that's really all you have to do. I'm just eyeballing this based on the ingrain, and that'll be enough. I mean, if your average groove is a quarter inch to three eighths of an inch deep, I'm probably a quarter inch now. So you can see it doesn't take a lot. And some of that is I'm dealing with soft pine and I've got a, a relatively short board. Um, when I was doing this on my blanket chest, I had you know 36 inch long boards and cherry. But now what I've got is the extents of this groove are sawn and I just have to remove the material in between, which becomes a heck of a lot easier for a tool like uh, a rabbit plane or a router plane. But even then, I prefer to grab a chisel and a mallet and working bevel down just try to hog out material. And I like to work bevel down because I can kind of scoop. As I drop the handle, it's disengaging from the cut. And what that's preventing it from doing is diving too deep. I and mean, you can see it wants to split along the grain. Take advantage of that. But if you drive too deep, when I drop the handle, I'm essentially wedging material out now. I'm not, I don't want to go too deep. And 
to some extent, it's going to want to follow the path of least resistance. I've got saw cuts here, and while they're not severing across the grain, which would be ideal, they are at least breaking up the grain to a certain depth, and the wood will kind of want to follow that same depth. There's weakness where that saw cut runs. So as long as you're not, you know, hammering away and driving super deep and paying no attention, you'll find that the wood will want to stay close to those saw cuts. So now, chopping that out, the bottom of this groove, we're pretty close. I mean, again, this for frame and panel or something like that, and this actually in the blanket chest, I was sliding a shelf, which was a frame and panel shelf, into here. So if as long as this were deep enough at its shallowest part, I could be done. Like it doesn't have to be perfectly flat because I specifically wanted it to be deeper to allow expansion and contraction. So there is something to be said about leave it with the chiseled surface and move on. But this could also be where you grab, is it? Oh, no, it's not. I was gonna say, this is my narrowest uh, rabbit plane and it's just not, it won't fit in there. Um, will the blade, router blade fit in there? No, I didn't make it wide enough. It's close, it's close, but it's, uh, you know what, let's do it anyway. Let's grab this guy. So now I can come back with the router plane and at least get myself a consistent flatness. This is not set properly. So I set it to the shallower sections and then I adjust it just by tapping it on the bench top. This work is way too heavy duty for this little tiny router plane, but I just don't want to go through the trouble of swapping out the big router plane blade at this point um, because I'm going to switch to a different demonstration in just a second. But you can see here is how I go about flattening out this groove. And you just continue to advance the blade with little taps. That was a big tap. A really big tap. <laughs> now I'm taking off way too much wood, which talking about router plane best practices, the router plane is not a heavy removal tool. It does not do well when you start trying to take huge amounts of wood off. This blade is entirely unsupported, just hanging out below here, and it will cause tear out, it will cause all kinds of problems. But now I do have a shaving from one end to the other and I've got a groove that is too far into the interior of a board for a fence plane to deal with. And that's the way that I would do that. If this were a little bit wider, I could use this plane as long as it dropped in there, this narrow rabbit plane and do the same thing and probably a heck of a lot faster than it would with a router plane. Um, I certainly could take a heavier setting because I've got support through the sole here, whereas there's no support with that blade hanging out. So, I mean, those are kind of the only ways that I go about doing grooves anymore. Um, that second method obviously uses all kinds of tools between chisel saws and the plane. Primarily though, most of my grooves live, you know, close to the edge of the board, like we had with this guy, and I can use a fence plane for that. So, um, yeah, uh, Witty's workshop caught that. I was using a crosscut saw to, to actually rip, and I was not struck by lightning. Um, I'm still breathing. It worked. Now, would it have been more efficient to use a rip saw? Heck yeah. In fact, for a cut like that, I've got a, um, a tenon saw all over there that would have done a much better job. When I did this in my blanket chest with a 36 inch long board, I used my 18 inch tenon saw big 18 inch long plate. Actually, no, that's wrong. I used, um, yeah, I did. I used my 18 inch tenon saw, big, long blade, aggressive toothing, you know, aggressive pitch that worked best. But yeah, I used a sash saw and uh, no, um, no bunnies died. 
everything went on, you know, life went on. <sighs> Use the tools that you have. It doesn't have to be perfectly specialized. So, um, questions about grooves before I move over to dados? I might have missed some questions I didn't scroll up. Uh, what solutions for for the bruising burnishing that occurs with a heavy router cut? Uh, the solution is don't take a heavy router cut. Um, if you're burnishing the surface because you're pushing down real hard on the router plane, that's a matter of smooth plane the board. So what, what Sean is asking is a lot of times you can burnish the surface just with the sole of the plane. I think that's what he's asking. You can burnish the surface as you run the, the, the plane across. Smoothing plane, set real, real light, couple passes, will cl clear that up. Um, but I also tend to find that that happens when you've got the router plane, either the blade's too dull um, or you've got it set too heavily and you're really like having to push down and grind the thing through. A lightly set router plane, in other words, designed to take the type of cut that it was meant to do, doesn't require a lot of pressure down um, to, to pull it off. Uh, dados. Dados are kind of a different story here because now it's all cross grain work. And we absolutely want to mark the edges. So uh, you can use a dado plane. That's kind of the obvious solution. Dado plane must be made for dados, right? Um, dado planes can be kind of finicky, fiddly. No, not fiddly, finicky. Um, they can sometimes be hard to control the depth. Like I talked about earlier, the depth stops tend to be kind of narrow, but dado planes tend to excel across a wider board. So imagine a bookshelf, 12, 15 inch wide sideboards that you're gonna put dados into or a book, uh, uh, um, case of some sort. That's really where I wanna use a dado plane. If I have a board that needs a dado that's maybe eight inches or narrower, especially six inches and under, I don't use the dado plane because I find that's actually really difficult on a narrower board. Um, it can be a little tippy. This is about the switchover point where I would maybe go to a dado plane. But as I go on a narrower board like this, it just doesn't make sense. I'm making the short little pass and the plane wants to tip off the end or tip off the front and it can be really hard to control. And the extra setup required to use a dado plane for a short thing like this it's so much easier to saw it out and chop it out. Basically what you just saw me do with the groove, that works even better across the grain. And I definitely would use the sash saw there. And in fact, why I have a sash saw is for cutting the extensive dados on casework. That's why it's called a sash saw. Um, so I bring the dado to bear, the dado plane to bear, when I've got wider dados that need to be done. And a certain amount of repeatability comes into this. If I have, you know, if you're making a case, generally you have two sides. If you're making a bookshelf, generally there are two sides. Not always, there are some designs where they're not that way, but you generally want to try to have some repeatability in the depths and the widths and all, widths and all that stuff. That being said, you know, you can find a wide variety of dado plane widths available. Three eighths, quarter inch, three quarter, three quarter is very rare. Seven eighths is incredibly common. I actually suggest a half inch. I find the half inch dado plane is the most utility. Um, three quarter is very difficult to find because obviously back in the 18th century, three quarter, this arbitrary three quarter inch thickness that we have now because of modern milling techniques did not exist then. Seven eighths was much more common because you would have four quarter stock that once it was dimensioned down uh, was close to seven eighths. And that was you know the male part of the dado joint. So you made a dado, the female part, to match that seven eighths thickness. Um, to me, if you have a seven eighths inch dado, you're, you automatically are having to go with that thick of a, of a case side or of a shelf, say in a book bookshelf. A lot of times I may wanna use thinner material. Well, you can't make a dado thinner than the thickness of the plane. If you have a seven eighths inch dado plane, you can't make three quarter inch dados. They're, they're very sloppy dados, in other words. They're, they're gonna be way too loose. So it's best to have a dado plane that's on the smaller size that you can then scale up. Um, I have a blog post, maybe nine, eight years old, called the Adjustable Width Dado Plane. Um, 
And sure enough, here is my 1 8 inch dado plane shim. This is the same one that was in that blog post from eight or nine years ago. And that's all it is. It's actually a bit of um, maple that's been planed down to an eighth of an inch, consistent thickness. Um, and it gets nothing glamorous. It gets double stick taped to the side. Um, so what I'll do is plow out a dado. This is a half inch dado plane. I'll plow out a half inch wide dado. Um, and if I need that to be wider, I slap this eighth inch guy on and it bumps it over an eighth of an inch and it now gives me a five eighths inch wide dado. Um, you can use a variety of shims to get the exact size you need, but I find that um, the five eighths inch dado works really well for me. If I'm making a bookshelf and I'm using three quarter inch thick shelves, I can make um, uh, a, a slightly uh, a small rabbit on the end and have it mate or I can continue to shim the dado out until I get the right fit for that shelf but the, the key is the dado plane itself is narrower than the intended joinery so that you can shim it to make it wider if you have a three-quarter inch dado plane you're set on that width um, you probably want your shelf stock to be fat of the size of that dado so that you can plow the dado and then plane down the shelf to get the perfect fit um, trying to get it exact can be a little very fiddly when you're doing stuff by hand. So um, I happen to have a 7 8 inch dado. Um, I have a 3 8 inch dado plane and the half inch. And speaking from personal experience here, guys, the half inch does all the work. This 7 8 inch dado, like my plow plane, was covered uh, with a lot of dust because it just very rarely gets used. Um, they live in my tool cabinet, and this is the one that gets used time and time and time again. So the beauty of these is they pretty much can do everything you want them to without need for any additional work. Technically, like I think it was Mike who asked the marking gauge question earlier, Technically, what Mike said would apply here. You would want to have knife lines for this um, just to sever the grain. But the dado plane does have dual knickers down here that will sever the grain. So technically, I can get away with just setting up a fence and going to town. Um, and I should say, I should add that dado planes need to run against a fence. They do not do well when they are free-handed. Don't expect to, to hold a setting very well, in other words. Now again, if I were doing this for actual joinery for a piece, there would be a lot more precision and squares and all that stuff brought to bear to make sure that this was lined up where I wanted and exactly square to the case side. But now I've got a fence to run against. The blind side, this is the, the escapement side, this is called the blind side, runs up against that fence. My knickers have been advanced so I can pull back along the board and that is my marking gauge line. So. If I were to use a knife to lay in my gauge lines, I would use a square and a knife. This is super easy because I can set the fence in place that exactly locates where this is gonna go. So if I had a story stick or something like that, I would line my fence up against my, my pencil lines or my knife line or whatever. And pulling this back, I now have my knife lines. And frankly, this can go even a little bit deeper. Ooh, I just caught my finger on the uh, corner there. Just did a Royer Underhill, folks. I'm now bleeding live. <laughs> I advance those knickers a little bit more and they'll cut even deeper now. So now with those cross grain fibers severed, I should be good to go. Uh, the one thing that Roy never does is stop to apply a Band-Aid. Um, I'm going to do that because I'm going to bleed everywhere if I don't. Shop first aid kit, guys. Keep it around. 
It's actually not that bad. It's just exactly where I'm holding the plane. So I need to uh, put a Band-Aid on it. And since I've got a live audience, I can show off my fancy bacon strip Band-Aids. Because now it looks like I've got like raw meat on my finger because I've got a bacon strip Band-Aid. So there we go. All right. So now that those cross grain fibers are severed, I can start planing. So I don't know how deeply I have this set. Pretty light. The other thing is this board has a cup in it. Um, it's not the end of the world, but it does make planing things a little difficult as I navigate that cup. Fortunately, the convex side is up so I can kind of ride up and over it. Um, this is set really lightly. I'm going to go a little bit deeper here just so that we're not taking forever. Now, you'll notice I am planing straight off the other side. So I'm getting blowout or spelching is the fun British term on the other side. Honestly, not that much. Um, it's pretty good because the blade, by the way, has been freshly sharpened. That helps a lot. But there are steps that I can take. I can use a saw cut on the far side down to depth that will prevent the spelching. I don't bother. In fact, what I tend to do, if I know that I'm using a dado plane to make the dados, I will purposely leave my shelf, my case stock, wider than I need it to be. So then I can go to town and plane aggressively here and not worry about any spelching I get because when I'm done, I'll come back and plane this edge and it cleans up the spelching that was created. Where's my depth stop here? Oh, wow. <laughs> my depth stop is way too high. I'm planing like a five eighths inch deep dado. There it goes. So now it's not cutting. Now, I've said before how the depth stop is treated as a suggestion. This has a wider depth stop. I love this plane for that purpose. But you'll also see kind of the two-handed technique. As I'm running across the, the board here, I've got pressure down on the toe. Very little pressure in the back. It's just pushing forward. As the sole, the tail end behind the blade hits, I will now apply pressure down in both, both hands. So I'm evenly distributed across the board and I can feel that depth stop riding. And with that even pressure, I can't get a cut. So I can trust that my depth stop setting is good there. But even then, I can push down a little bit more and I can still get it to cut a little bit. Now, in this case, as I push down, I think I'm actually flattening out the cup because the little shaving I'm getting is right there in the middle. So it actually be pretty good. So now, The resulting dado, super crisp and clean. I mean, look at those walls, really sharp. Here again, this was sharpened like a minute before I went live. Um, I de can't say the same for that router plane blade that I was using, which accounts for any uh, lack of crispness, but you're not gonna get a crisper dado than that. Look at the bottom, the floor of that, super beautiful. A um, Little bit of spelching on this side, but as I said, nothing that planing across this edge and it's it's shallow enough there's very little splitting again the sharp blade helps control that spelching so like two passes with my jack plane and there would be no more spelching so that's like the preferred method and when you see what i've got whatever this is about a 10 inch wide board this makes really good sense for a plane like this trying to do the sawing method would still work um it's nice that i happen to have a 14 inch sash saw that could handle that, but that's still a long cut to make for this blade. Um, I would really rather use something longer. Um, I might even grab my miter box saw, a nice 24 inch saw to do this. But again, it's if you have that, making 
a sawn dado on a board like this makes a lot more sense. And it's so much faster than all the additional trouble of setting up the fence and all that stuff. If I don't have to make seven or eight dados of the same size, which again, you saw how simple it was to make. If I had to make four more, it's just a matter of moving the fence and going to town, planing until it stops planing. If you've just got one or two to make, it's so much easier in my opinion to saw it out. So where's my square? There it is. So here I would lay in the extents with a square and a knife. And this is a good opportunity to just use those first class saw cuts, knife walls, whatever the heck you want to call them. Um, it will just help you keep a little bit crisper line. Uh, certainly can help position your saw a little, but um, I find that it's especially useful in really splinter prone woods like this red oak. Fortunately, this is not big box red oak. This is actual lumber yard red oak. So it's going to behave a lot better than that microwave crap they sell at Home Depot. Um, so here I can ride up against those knife walls. I don't have a depth mark here. I'm just going to eyeball it. That'll work. You see, I move my fingers forward. I start it pressed up against my fingers. I start on this end and I move my fingers forward, kind of like a set of training wheels until that kerf is fully established. Now it's kind of running in the kerf and it's not going to jump out of it unless I have really poor body mechanics. Now the extents are sawn and this is where I grab my chisel and my mallet. Now here I'm going cross grain. So this comes up nicely. All that long grain fiber is severed. Um, in this case, I uh, probably, you know, if this was to the final dimension, I would want to tackle it from both sides. So I don't completely blow out the far side there. And now is where the router plane can finish it up. Here again, if I had, you know, a rabbit plane that might work. This happens to be a straight rabbit, not skewed like these data planes or like a lot of wooden rabbit planes. So it's not going to cut as cleanly across the grain. But to me, this is where the router plane excels. This is really what it does best. Um, and I've used a couple of different ones. <sighs> Lee Nielsen I've used. I've used the, obviously the Veritas, that's what I have here. A couple of vintage Stanleys. Um, I've used wooden ones. Um, I really like this Veritas just because it's so expandable. It's got a lot of different features you can add on, use it for inlay, things like that. But it can be a little bit fiddly. The depth stop again, uh, again, this is like first generation Veritas here. I know they've made improvements to the depth stop. Um, there was even something where I could like mail in and get a replacement one. And I don't think I ever bothered to do that. But um, the depth stop on these are especially a suggestion. They do not, should not be trusted. So what I'm going to do, I find is I kind of get close to my depth setting. I have a little bit of Sharpie marker right here on the adjuster that just gives me a reference point. And I try not to do any more than half a rotation. So it was at 12 o'clock. I just moved it down to six o'clock and I'm still pretty just nipping the tops here. One of the unique things I found about the Veritas plane a little bit with some of the vintage Stanley is I've locked this in place. I just made the cut, but there's still a little bit of play. It's almost like backlash on a, on a, you know, a bench plane. I, take up that little bit of backlash, then I loosen it, 
then I turn it half a rotation, then I tighten it up again and go from there. If you just loosen it and turn half a rotation, you'll find that you're not actually getting as deep a cut because you see, I haven't loosened this. As I advance it forward, I've got about a quarter rotation. Uh, not a quarter rotation, about an eighth of a rotation off of that. And I can actually go all the way to a quarter. Um, so there's that little bit of, of kind of take up the slack, then loosen it, and then go a half rotation from there. It's just an oddity of the Veritas. Now, the next thing is the position. You've got these nice, comfy handles here. Do not grab the handles and go to town. You notice my technique is I've got the handles nestled in my palms and I've got my index fingers on the plane. My thumbs are resting on the body of the plane and my thumb, my index fingers are out front. That's what's controlling it. When you do this, you lose some of the control. It's like writing your name with a pencil without having your hand anchored on the wood. Um, you could do that. You're going to look like a five-year-old. If you have your hand on the wood, you can sign your name or do whatever a lot more efficiently. Same, actually, the same thing with the chisel, by the way. If you're chiseling, you should always have your palm registered on the wood. By holding it like this, I have very little control over this. And you find that the plane can tip forward. It can even go side to side a little bit. You can get shavings underneath it. And you, can, you find that it will stop cutting. So then when, when it stops cutting, people think, well, I need to advance the cut. So they advance the cut and they start cutting again and they find that suddenly it like bogs down in one place or another and they get this like section of the the cut that is is doesn't want to cut because you're trying to take you know a half an inch of material off because the plane shifted on you so really keep your palms the meteor palms really centered on those nice round comfy knobs and there's a lot of pressure on the toe of the plane as i enter the cut and then as the plane works its way on, I've got even pressure in my thumbs and my forefingers, keeping it balanced. As I come to the end, the pressure lets up on the front and the pressure is focused on the back to keep it from tipping forward. Just like a bench plane where you want to have that even transfer of weight from toe to tote, from knob to tote throughout. And if you make that pressure unequal, you will end up tapering your board. Same thing with the router plane. And that's one of the biggest mistakes I see a lot of people using is they're just grabbing the handles and they lose touch with the sole. And they can't really control the depth of cut and how the plane is running. I shouldn't say the number one mistake I see with router planes is too heavy a cut. And you can see just by the pitch of this removal and the size of these chips, what that half a rotation is doing, it really hogs off a fair amount of material. If I rotate this a full turn, I get way too aggressive of a cut. And you'll find that the plane becomes really hard to control. It also tears out the end a lot. And you get these sections where, because it's so deep and because a router plane has its bevel up, the wedging action is the bevel. So that wedge is trying to drive the blade deeper. When you've got a heavy cut, a deep cut, that wedge has more power and it's pulling the blade down in and you can actually get this blade to slip on the post. There's enough force from the wedging action that it will actually cause it to slip. I don't care how much you tighten this up, the wedge will win and it will advance that too far forward. So I've been taking half a rotation. I'm pretty close to the bottom. Now I'm going to go a quarter rotation, even less. And I mean, again, tough red oak, heavy grain wood going across the grain, but I still, I got a slightly better quality cut from that. I can go even less a rotation and really dial this in to the final depth that I want. The key is if, you know, sometimes I'll do this kind of stutter type step, kind of get a run up and get it to work. I find that helps a lot, especially across grain and oak like this. But if you're taking a light cut that really shouldn't be necessary. You really should be able to make smooth passes here, removing an even amount of wood throughout. And again, with its light, a light cut like that, you're not having to push down too much. You're not getting that burnished surface. You're also not losing control of the plane. And the result is in, in difficult red oak, really crisp walled dado. The saw cut gave me nice crisp walls. 
and the floor is way smoother and cleaner and flatter than it really needs to be because again this is you know oh no don't tell me that i actually cut that no i didn't okay i was gonna say what are the chances of laying out a dado by eye and having it perfectly match uh the board that happened to be on the bench but you know, the quality of that floor doesn't really matter because it's just going to be covered by whatever gets inserted in there so that's the two methods that I would use for build for making a dado. A dado plane, as you can see, it's, it's elegant, gives you great dados, but you know, this is a really nicely tuned, freshly sharpened dado plane. Um, I can trust the, the depth stop, all that stuff. The router, I think, is the path of least resistance, and it's the method that I use more often than not, because the router tends to already be on my bench, already ready to go to work. Um, it's one of the reasons that <clears throat> the router plane actually lives in the door of my cabinet because these are the tools that I reach for the most often. Um, my data planes, you know, they're not inaccessible here on the middle shelf, but they don't get used as much. Um, so, yeah, that's the, that's my, my spiel. Um, what have I missed? Lots of chat. I did the dado with a sash saw. Carcass saw would work just fine there. Um, shouldn't be any set on a rip saw, right? Uh, wrong. There, there's, there's set on every saw. Um, well, I guess it depends on what rip saw we're talking about. A dovetail saw is a rip filed saw. <laughs> a very fine finely finely set almost no set at all on a dovetail saw because of the precision nature of the of the uh the dovetails that we're cutting tenon saw is going to have a much wider set to it a uh, rip hand saw massively wide set so no there is absolutely set on a rip saw is the data plane square or skewed i think i answered that it is a skewed blade um, because it's meant to cut across the grain Uh, yes, it is a Bruce Bruce Carver's mallet. Uh, is it the 16 ounce? I have no idea. <laughs> Yet again, I'm an early adopter of good tools. This was one of the first ones that, that Dave made. So it's not a resin infused one. Um, no idea of the weight. Whatever he first came out with. I don't think it's 16 ounces. It feels lighter than that. Any other questions before I call it a night? And here I thought I wouldn't have enough to talk about with dados and grooves. Happy birthday, Woody's Workshop. Uh, Sean's clarifying about his burnishing question. Shavings get underneath, so the hand position will solve the burnishing issue. <laughs> the other thing is just keep clearing it off. Um, I mean, I don't know if you saw, as I was doing this, I was constantly brushing or blowing the, the material out of the way. Because, yeah, the stuff gets stuck underneath it. But more importantly, shavings between the sole and the, the plane throw off the depth. And the plane will start to rock and you get other problems. The router plane blade is so delicately balanced. I don't know if that's the right word for it, but because the blade is hanging exposed off the bottom here, there's no mouth, um, there's no sole uh, to dampen the, the, the vibrations around the blade. The blade's having to do all that work. There is a sole to the plane, but the plane, the sole of the plane is at a totally different geometric plane than the blade itself. So the tiniest little imperfections in the surface, shavings, grit, under the sole itself and the floor of the dado, those little things can cause the blade to disengage. So the ideal position for the router plane blade is to have its entire width engaged in cutting at about the same depth. So you're getting even pressure across the width of that bevel um, and that causes it to engage and cut cleanly. If the pressure on that bevel 
gets heavier on one side or the other, the blade, because it's not supported, will want to tip and it will try to follow the path of least resistance. So if I've got a thick shaving on one side and a thinner shaving on the other, it will ride up on the lighter side and it will dig deeper um, conversely on the other side. So uh, I think it was Jason who brought this question up on Instagram. He said he has it where it's not cutting and then it's cutting like massively deep. It's because the blade becomes weighted differently. Um, so those first couple of cuts, when I move from chisel to router plane, those are really light because now the surface is really uneven and it's hills and valleys and left to right jagged because I chopped it out with a chisel. I take a really light cut until I get a relatively even surface. Then I can start taking a heavier cut because now I'm engaging the router plane blade evenly. The minute something comes between the sole and the wood that causes the plane to tip, that blade disengages. It loses that adherence, if you will. Um, and that unevenness causes the wedge to go crazy because there's just nothing, there's no support around the blade. Every plane here has some amount of support. You know, a molding plane, just like a bench plane, that blade, that profile is supported at the toe and the heel all the way throughout. You get a nice clean cut that way. You get vibration dampening, you can control that blade a lot more. Router plane doesn't have that, um, which is why the router plane is not made for forming joinery, it's made for refining joinery. You should, if you're making a groove or a dado or a rabbit with a router plane, you should rough it to shape with a chisel, with a saw, with whatever, and then come and you get that flat, bottom, the clean bottom um, with the router plane. And that's light cuts at that point. There's your best practice, Jason. I don't know if Jason's in the chat room or not, but your best practice is nice light cuts. Uh, spear point blade. Yeah, I didn't bring those up. Um, I actually have a spear point blade. Um, that actually uh, can be a good solution in tough grain like this because the spear point um, kind of like the skew blade, it's hitting it at an angle um, and that kind of moves through like a wedge and it can help shear the fibers a little bit more. It's not necessary, as you just saw, using you know the flat blade. Um, I very rarely switch that out. Um, the spear point's in my, in my um, tool chest right there, but a lot of times I forget it's there or I'm too lazy to swap it out. There is no doubt that it can make harder, more disagreeable woods a little bit easier to work with. Uh, yeah. Oh, Matt's got a great point. Vintage router planes have gone up in price massively. Just go buy a Veritas one, man. <laughs> the amount of things that I've been able to do with my Veritas plane, like this inlay cutter headset. Um, I bought this, I don't know, in the last couple of years or so to use it for stringing. This thing is awesome. Um, way better, I find, than the Lee Nielsen stringing set. Um, I shouldn't say way better. There are slightly different applications, but this is fantastic for that. Um, Veritas has so many different little things that get added onto that. To me, it's just, it's the best router plane that I've ever worked with. Um, if it wasn't for supply chain issues, I'd say it's the ultimate choice, but it might take you three years to get it these days. All righty, folks. I need to call it a night because I'm hungry. <laughs> Not to put too fine a point on it. Um, and uh, David, I think I just answered your question. Uh, he said Lee Nielsen or Veritas. I've used both extensively. Veritas to me, hands down. I like it much better. I don't like the arch of the Veritas plane. I like a consistent sole or a closed mouth router plane. Same thing with the miniature router plane. I do use the smaller Lee Nielsen plane. I have one of those in that drawer right there. I do use that a fair amount, but um, I don't like that arched open mouth format that Lee Nielsen uses and a lot of vintage Stanley use. I much prefer the closed mouth. Um, it's more sole to reference. Hands down, much, much better. Um, in the coming weeks, uh, I'm going to do, I did a little bit of wooden planes tonight. I'm going to be talking the difference between metal planes and wooden planes, at least in my experience. As you can probably tell, I'm a metal plane user, but I do have some wooden plane uses, wooden planes around here. I'll be talking about that. Uh, I don't know if the next episode or not, and I'm going to be doing um, mitered half laps. These miter joints on the framing panel here are actually half laps. Um, that was a good solution or suggestion from a from Patreon patron that I definitely want to demonstrate that. Uh, we're going to be talking. I don't know. I've got some other stuff. I've got a bunch of topics for the next couple of weeks to to do. So uh, 
Stay tuned to my Instagram if you're a, a, a patron of the show. I certainly always uh, push out. Um, I call for questions, let people know I'm going to be doing a live stream, but I always do it on Instagram as well. Um, so yeah, that's uh, the last thing I'll say about that. Uh, otherwise, 